Good morning. I uh, feel like this morning's service has already been enough of a blessing, but I'm going to continue anyway. Um, the scripture reading this morning is uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. I want to have a prayer this morning. I'm going to kneel. I invite you. You're welcome to remain seated. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity that we have an opportunity that you have provided us to meet with you every week. Lord, we thank you for this day, this day of rest where we can come apart from the cares and the challenges of the world and spend time with you and with fellow believers. Lord, let this day be a blessing to us. Lord, let the words that I speak be words that you would have spoken and not words that man has devised. Thank you, Lord, for hearing my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you have a favorite scripture? Do you have a favorite scripture? Do you have more than one favorite scripture? Do you have multiple favorite scriptures? I have that same, that same problem. I'm going to share one with you as we begin uh, the message this morning. This is one of my favorite texts. And it's found in Revelation 21, verses 1 through 3. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Have you ever taken just a few moments and closed your eyes and imagined that day. After years of sin and suffering, Christ has finally returned. It's going to be more spectacular than we could imagine even in our wildest of imaginations. We still don't know exactly when that's going to be, but, but we know it's going to be soon. It doesn't take much to figure that out. We look around at the world around us. You know, you can spend a considerable amount of time talking about the mess we're in, about the problems that exist, giving no doubt multiple examples of problems that you see in government, banking, our private lives, foreign countries, the wars we're experiencing, news stories we're seeing. But talking about it doesn't really do anything to solve the problems. We are indeed seeing prophecy fulfilled before our very eyes. And if you're not seeing it, it's only because you're not looking. I was having a discussion with a gentleman at work this week. After listing a litany of the many things he was unhappy about, from the recent banking problems we're seeing in the news, to the weather, with me getting very few words in edgewise, he turned heel to leave abruptly and said, well, there's really nothing we can do about it anyway. One man just can't make a difference anymore. And with that, he was gone. I thought we were in the middle of a conversation 
I thought there was time to, to discuss this further, but whoosh, off he went. Apparently, I was wrong. I have to admit, I was, was a little stunned. It happened so quickly. One minute we're conducting business, and the next he's filled with despair, and yet seemingly resigned to this fate, and the fate of mankind in general. We see a lot of the same people where I work. And I suspect he'll be coming in again soon. I'm planning on taking the opportunity to have a deeper discussion with him, and I hope that I'm afforded the time to do that. But here recently, these discussions are happening with greater frequency. Am I the only one? I, th I think we're all seeing this. It's easy to allow ourselves to be drawn into these little gripe sessions about all the bad things happening around us and all the things we don't like. It's also very dangerous. While we can't ignore them altogether, we must avoid these rabbit holes of negativism and focus on the things that matter most, eternal things. And while the discussion I described from work was, for the most part, unprofitable, what captured my attention and what stuck with me in that conversation was his statement. One man just can't make a difference anymore. Obviously, he's not completely correct in his statement. Everyone makes a difference at some level. But I understand his frustration. As Christians, we know one person can make a difference. One individual who is filled with the Holy Spirit and who is led by God can make a difference. Scripture is full of examples. People like Abraham, Isaac, Rebekah, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, David, Esther, Solomon, Elijah, Elisha, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Christ, Moses, David, Mary Magdalene, Dorcas, Paul, and Peter, just to name a few. I wonder if they had any idea the influence that God gave them the opportunity to have in their lifetimes. Then there are people like Ellen White, J.N. Andrews, our Adventist pioneers, parents, teachers, pastors, and many, many other individuals who make a difference. I believe one individual can still make a difference in this world. In thinking about Revelation 21, 1 through 3, it occurred to me that one day when we will behold him, the issue of whether or not we made a difference will be an important issue. God has given each of us a number of talents designed to benefit our families, our community, our church, and he expects us to use these talents. We are responsible for cultivating these talents to the benefit of others, to draw others to Christ. We are each called to make a difference. The story found in Matthew 25 of the master who distributed talents to his servants illustrates this point. Let's take a look at this parable. Beginning in verse 14 of Matthew 25. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents to another, two, and to another, one. To every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Now it's important for the purposes of discussion of this parable to understand that one talent would today be equal to approximately 15 years wages. or one million dollars. So the first servant was given five talents, five million dollars. 
Still a lot of money. The second, two million, and the third, one million. Now put yourself in the place of the master for just a moment. You're leaving town. You call three servants in, five million to you, two million to you, one million to you. I'll be back soon. You know the story in verses 16 through 18, we find the first two servants took those talents and engaged in trade, doubling the money they had received. The third servant dug a hole and hid the talent that had been given him. The first two did well, and again from Scripture, after a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, we all know these words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Now I was thinking about this and I put myself in the place of the, the master in this parable. If I had the wherewithal to give you five million dollars and you invested it and you gave me 10 million back, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I mean, really, that, that is an accomplishment. Think about that. He doubled what was given to him. The second servant had the same con conversation with his master, returning another two talents along with the two he had received from his master with the same result. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Now we don't know how big the master's estate was. Kind of let your mind run wild there. We now come to the third servant in verse 24. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee, that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid. And I went and hid my talent in the earth. Lo, here thou hast what is thine. And, and I was looking at that statement, there thou hast what is thine. It's almost as if he's saying, there, there, take that away from me. There, take what is yours. His Lord answered and said unto him practically what he had said already. He said, thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not and gathered where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. The master then commands that the wicked and slothful servant be cast into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Just as the talents given by the master were given for the benefit of the master, so the talents we have been given by the master have been given us to benefit God's kingdom. We may have been blessed and given many gifts, many advantages, many opportunities by God. And we may have thought in the past that we have done this all by ourselves, but this is not the case. We are to take these talents and cultivate them. If we've been given a few talents, we are not to look at others who seem to have greater advantage and feel that we are not responsible for using the talent we have been given. 
We are not to hide our talent, as did the wicked servant. Using the talents we have been provided, we can make a difference. We must make a difference. The expansion of God's kingdom is reliant on us doing our part. Christians are not called simply to fill a space in church, pay tithes and offerings, and live lives of contentment. Christians are called to emulate Christ. We are called to share a life-changing, destiny-altering message that heralds Christ as the Savior and champions a change that bears fruit. We're all familiar with a quote from Sister White in Christ Object Lessons, page 67. Christ is seeking to reproduce himself in the hearts of men, and he does this through those who believe in him. The object of the Christian life is fruit-bearing, the reproduction of Christ's character in the behavior that it may be reproduced in others. Christ did not come to earth to live a life of ease. Christ came to reveal the Father. And in so doing, he put himself at mortal risk to save us. Are we asked to do something less for others? If we are to be like Christ, are we asked to do less? Are we to have so little care for those around us that we accept no risk in bringing the gospel message to our friends and neighbors? Romans 8, 29 says it this way, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn of many brethren. Christ designs that we be conformed to the image of God designs, rather, that we be conformed to the image of Christ so that we can lead others to Him. One man, one woman, let's change that. Every man, every woman must make a difference. So Christ, when reproduced in us, will actuate us to meet the needs of others, both physically and spiritually, as we share the gospel. If we allow Christ to be reproduced in us, we will be like Christ. We will do the things that Christ did. And there's not enough time to cover all the many wonderful things that Christ did. I, I think sometimes we don't grasp a really a good picture of exactly what Christ accomplished. We, like Christ, will have a life surrendered to the will of God. In John 5.30, he said, I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. Throughout Christ's earthly ministry, he repeated this message. In John 4.34, Jesus said, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. In John 9.4, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, under the weight of the sins of the world, in Luke twenty-two forty-two, Christ in prayer says, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. You know, if we're going to be like Christ, we will always be ready to forgive others. I would not suggest, nor will you find anywhere in Scripture, that Christ was in the least flippant in forgiving sin. If anyone understood the cost of sin, it was Christ. But throughout Scripture, you will find that where the religious elite were ready to condemn those who were doing wrong or who did not follow the rules they had established that were less righteous than they were. Where they were ready to condemn, Christ freely offered forgiveness. We are to forgive others when they wrong us. Imagine where we would be 
if God forgave the way that we forgive? I'm not going to expound on that. If we're to be like Christ, we will be obedient to Scripture and the law of God. As a child, Christ read and studied the Scriptures. He understood the prophecies and was at all times obedient to the written word. When tempted by Satan, he quoted Scripture, saying, It is written. When replying to the accusations of the rules and Pharisees, he quoted Scripture. Scripture. The disciples followed his example in this regard. It is nothing short of hypocrisy to claim to be a Christian and live in disobedience to the teachings of Jesus as expounded upon in the Word of God. Leviticus 8, 5. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. I am the Lord. If we're to be like Christ, we're going to live an evangelistic life. In every interaction, every conversation, every encounter, Christ made an effort to bring humanity into a closer relationship with God. He was on a mission to meet those in need. He crossed the Sea of Galilee to heal the demoniac. He traveled to Samaria to meet the woman at the well. He went to Capernaum to heal the centurion's servant. He even had a conversion on the cross as he was dying. We've all heard the common saying, by beholding we become changed. In order to become like Christ, in order to behold Christ, we must have a knowledge of God and who Christ is. We must read the word. We must appropriate the word into our own characters. We must talk of Christ. We must talk like Christ. By beholding, we will become changed into his image. Ellen White in Letters and Manuscripts, volume 17, page 19, says, Now hide in Christ. Hide in him and think of Christ. Pray much. Do not talk a great deal. But pray much. And look unto Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. By beholding, we become changed into his divine image. One individual. Listening to the Holy Spirit under Christ's direction, can make a difference. Something to ponder. If we're not making a difference, what does that say? Can we say we're Christ-like? If we're not. As Christians, we must take the life and example that Christ left for us in his words and make it the focus of our daily lives. After Christ's ascension, the early church experienced many challenges as they looked to Christ's example as a template for their lives and for the mission of evangelizing the world. During this time, being a Christian came with great risks. Likewise, during the Dark Ages, Christians understood the profession of their faith could very well cost them their lives. The early reformers, John Wycliffe, Husson Jerome, Martin Luther, Zwingli, And many others understood the perils of trying to follow Christ's example and apply the principles found in Scripture. While their theology may not have always been perfect, they were willing to live the truth that was revealed to them, many times paying for that truth with their lives. You know, after the parable of the three servants in Matthew 25, Christ transitions into a brief summary of what will happen when he returns. In Matthew 25, 31, if you're following along. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations, 
and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto the one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. It's no coincidence that the parable of the three servants is followed by this summation of Christ's return. We may not immediately see the outcome of the benefits of our use of the talents God has provided, but we are to use them. We may not feel like we are making a difference, but we are not to rely on our feelings, our perceptions, our opinions, or the feelings, perceptions, and opinions of others. If we will allow Christ to be reproduced in us, we will make a difference. And on that great day, when Christ returns, we too will hear the words, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. I believe God is telling us here through Scripture that if we will follow him and we will use the talents he's given us, and draw others to him, we will have great reward in heaven, in heaven. In closing, I want to share two quotes from my favorite author. I see in Jesus everything that is lovely, everything that is holy, everything that is uplifting and pure. Then why should I want to open my eyes wide to see everything that's disagreeable. By beholding, we become changed. Let us look to Jesus and consider the loveliness of his character. And by beholding, we shall become changed into the same likeness. And then from Christ's Object Lessons, page 69, a quote we're all more than familiar with. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. I hope this is your prayer this morning. I know it's mine. Let's bow our heads as we close. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we ask that you would come into our lives. And Lord, if we're, if we're on the fence, Lord, I pray that you would send your Holy Spirit. And that he would work us over until we see what it is that we need to do. We want to be faithful, Lord. We want to see you again someday. We want to be in heaven with you. Not because of heaven, but because of you. Thank you, Lord, for the surety of your word. 
for the information that you provide for us that tells us of your love for us and your desire to be with us again. Lord, bless us as we leave. Help us to witness to those that we come into contact with to be a benefit to your kingdom, to lead others to you. In your name we pray, amen. Please stand and sing our closing hymn with us, number 206, Face to Face. <coughs> You'll be dismissed by our deacons.